eighthly, that it was, in its flavor, it was like ginger. As said by as -Sudey. The salwa is a type of bird. And also had the honey taste. أقول قول هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم أستغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم يرحم الرحيم ولا إله إلا الله. We have reached ayah fifty-seven. We've reached ayah fifty-seven of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has blessed us to reach ayah fifty-seven of Surah Al-Baqarah. We started from forty-one and reached fifty-seven, so we are gaining ground because. Obviously, the main groundwork of the Qur'an from Surah Al-Fatiha and the explanation in the beginning, the preface to Fatiha all the way into Baqarah, the groundwork has been laid. So now, we're just dealing solely with narrative information and the commentary on the ayat. And every now and then the qira'ah. Is it, is it bari'ikum, bari'ukum, these type of things. Is there a question of what we've covered today? Yes, sister. Um, is it permissible to ask for forgiveness of sins for those that passed away? question is, is it permitted to ask for the forgiveness of sins for those that have passed away? Alhamdulillah. The condition is, is that they are believers. As long as those people are Muslims, forgiveness of sins can be asked for them. Forgiveness of sins cannot be asked from an unbeliever. Because the unbeliever, their situation has been closed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned about those who are Muslims from before us that lived. He told us in Surah Al Hashr, the 59th Surah, Ayah 10. وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِن بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ Those who came after them say, Our Lord forgive us and our brothers who preceded us in faith. And do not put any hatred in our heart towards those who believe. Lord, you are the benevolent, the most compassionate. Surah Al-Hashim, the 59th Surah, Ayah 10. It shows we can ask forgiveness for the sins of all the Muslim, believing Muslim brothers and sisters that died before. And there's also an indicative within that that shows those who believe. So those who didn't, forgiveness isn't asked for them. And the proof for that is that those who don't believe aren't your brothers and sisters, even though they may be by lineage. What's the proof? Surah the Tawbah, the ninth Surah, Ayah 11. When they believe, pray, and give the zakah, then فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينَ Then they are your brothers in faith. Prior to then, what are they? Not your brothers, they're your enemies. So that's correct. That's correct. Another question? Yes, brother. Um, I had two. Um, what was in regards to, I read somewhere when the exodus happened, uh, as a part of the Red Sea occurred. One, uh, I think it was um, Sam Ali, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but he actually saw an angel Jibreel on, uh, on the horse, like um, orchestrating the spirit. And the horse let, let some dust off, and he collected that dust. And when he got to where, where they went and the, the calf was built and constructed, he blew that dust into the calf and then started speaking. So I just wanted to know the validity of that. And second of all, you know, um, it was in Mount Sinai where, was it the revelation occurred for, for the Torah? Is that situated like in between Arabia and Egypt in that little teeth bit? And if that's the case, did they come from Cairo across into Saudi Arabia and then go up north? Or did they just carry on going up north towards Palestine? Okay, question. The first question has to do with um, the Samudi taking some of the dust that he saw 
from the horse of the angel Jibreel alayhi salam who was bringing about the parting of the sea into the two pieces and the Samuri taking some of the dust from that and using it to bring the calf to make the mooing and the speaking sounds alhamdulillah salatu salam rasulillah this is correct in another narration you have to remember Imam Jawzi rahimahullah is narrating but sometimes he's uh, using doing so in a pithy manner so it's correct it has indeed happened and he referred to it sort of backhandedly but not all of it that is correct as far as the second question which is how did the children of Israel approach Mount Sinai which is in the Sinai Peninsula um, how did they get from there to there and did they leave from Cairo to get there and so on and so forth Alhamdulillah Cairo as a city did not exist back then Cairo was built by Al-Qahir Billah who was a Fatimi Shia uh, general in 972 if memory serves me correct they were Fatimi in which a lot of their masjids faced towards Karbala so Al-Qahir uh, Billah is the one who built it before then the headquarters of Ramses II if I'm correct um, was at Thebes so if they left from Egypt they would have either left from Thebes, but you have to remember, the Israelites at that time, being slaves, were told to stay in a place known as Roshan. Roshan was near the Sinai Peninsula. The Sinai Peninsula is part of Arabia. To this day, Bedouins are there. It's called Arabia. Historically, it's been considered part of Arabia. They left from there to Mount Sinai. Today, at the base of Mount Sinai is St. Catherine's Monastery, which has the oldest Arabic copy of the Bible. The oldest Arabic copy of the Bible and probably the oldest Greek manuscripts that were found by American and British missionary travelers. The track of the Exodus, we don't have all of the details of exactly what the Exodus route was. Needless to say, we know that they crossed over a body of water. Now, whether that was the Red Sea or the Gulf of Suez, because the, um, the word used was sof. The, the Hebrews used the word sof, which is the sea of reeds. And the Arabs used bahar, which is a word for uh, sof or sea. It's been an assumption of later biblical writers that it was the Red Sea. Wallahu alam. Because Sea of Reeds is Bahar or it's called the Sof Sea of Reeds. Wallahu alam. Whether it was the Red Sea or the Gulf of Suez. It was one of them. But it's generally later scholars that categorically insist that it was the Red Sea. Wallahu alam. The path of the Exodus we do know was they left from Egypt, wandered in the Sinai Peninsula and part of uh, northwest Arabia for for 40 years then came into because remember northwest Arabia is near that's where they ran across the Nabataeans and then they came into what was called at that time uh, Sham was called the section they went into Sham was called Kanaan and that was when they met the Kanaaniyun what has been translated in English as Canaanites they met those people and came into the land and they were told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these people worship idols they're they're wretched they're wicked they have to be destroyed you are to lay waste to this area and to destroy every idol you find because the people were worshiping the idol malach and they used to burn their children on altars or burn a child on altar to malach and they would melt the flesh and offer that to malach so that's what we can say for the exodus route in a general sense but some of the specifics of uh how they made it from which city, I mean, I may think in my mind, that okay, it's Thebes, but they were in Roshan, which was away from Thebes. Maybe they went to Thebes and came out of Thebes, or maybe they went straight from Roshan, I don't know. That's something that would require a really hefty, I'm sure someone's probably done a lot of historical research into it. You could probably go to the library and get an idea of it, but I don't know for sure. So you, you would think as a Gulf of Suez that more than likely would have been crossed because that's where, the, the that's, where that, that's where that barrier is, yeah, the Gulf of Suez, most likely. Yeah. Is there another question? Yes? Um, when you spoke about the image of so-called Mary on top of this church, um, what would our explanation be of this as Muslims? Okay, 
question is regarding the apparition of what was claimed to be the Virgin Mary on top of the church in uh, Esiut. What would be our understanding as Muslims of this? Alhamdulillah, salatu wa rasulillah. Well, looking at it from all the empirical evidence, it's true. Just as much as I have seen people that are able to alter their size to become extremely tall and extremely short very quickly. I have met people who have literal fangs. I have met people who have no iris in their eye. Now, I can't deny that proof because it's clear. And I, by nature, am a very, very careful person in terms of affirming events and things. That event is true. The apparition of the woman that was on top of that church in Asyut is true. Is that Maryam as Siddiqa alayhi salam? No. So what was it? Probably a demon, demonic activity. I'm not surprised at all. The same thing I would say about people that have insisted that they've been aboard uh, unidentified flying objects in which they've met uh, asparagus-shaped beings that have committed acts upon them given men tests or implanted microchips into their brain or their skull and all these other things, I think there's a certain portion of that that may be correct. But that doesn't tell me that, oh, well, these, these uh, asparagus-shaped creatures, are they mala'ika? Of course not, because we have plenty of description of the mala'ika. So what is it? It's either demonic or something else. So these images, these images, the cow that was drinking a sulfur, Satya Sai Baba, who's able to transform by blowing in his hand to transform lead into gold. Right? That's true. He did that. That can be experimentally looked at and empirically examined. He did that. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, who declared that he was God incarnate, who actually was able to put a large spear through his heart and then remove it and still survive that's true that happened that happened in antelope oregon he can definitely he definitely did that he's dead now from aids but he he definitely did that it's true uh how do we explain it well you have to remember that there are two si there are two types of signs there was the mu'jiza which is the miracle that comes from a prophet and there was the karama the karama. Karama is a wonder that comes from a saint. But it's not from the welly of Allah that that happens. It's because of his love for Allah and his following that prophet why that miraculous incident occurs. Then you have something else, which is called an istidraj. An istidraj is a false sign from shaitan. A false sign from shaitan. You can find that the shaitan has his own type of revelation. Did you know the shaitan has his own type of revelation? That he gives his false teachers and false leaders? Surah An'am, the sixth surah, ayah 121. They reveal their false signs to one another. Yuhun, they reveal. Using the same word for revelation that Allah uses in Surah Al-Najm, the 53rd surah, ayah 1 through 2. The same wordings. See, one through three, the same wordings. He has false revelation, it's true revelation. So when we see images like that and we empirically examine them and say, yes, this definitely happened. To us as Muslims, that shouldn't be a surprise at all. Shaitan is in the earth. He has false signs. Isn't it the Dajjal, as, 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 isn't there, aren't there narrations in, the, in Sahih al-Jamiyah of the Dajjal pointing at the sky and it rains? Aren't there people on television that are believed that tell you tomorrow that it's going to rain and some Muslims believe them and take an umbrella? No, I'm serious. Because these people are telling you false signs. Yeah, it's going to rain. Remember from the early 80s, you had a newscaster in this country. In 1987, if memory serves me correct, say, oh, the weather's going to look great. Barometric pressure is fine. All is well. And it's looking to be a very sunny weekend. People got up the following morning, trees blown down. Doors kicked in. What happened? There'd been a hurricane in this country. That man was fired, obviously. 
So when you see things that happen that are true, that doesn't mean it's from Allah because it's real. There's a difference between something being real and something being true. 